Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to do a book haul for the month of March, even though it's already April, but you know, it is what it is. I have a lot of exciting books to talk about and I can't wait to share them with you. I can't wait to read a lot of them. I have read at least one of them and some of these are going to be coming out. They're not actually released yet. I have advanced copies of them. So this is my little PSA. If you are interested in any of these books, I'll have affiliate links to all of them in the description box down below for the ones that are not yet released. Those will be to pre-order the book. If you use the affiliate link, I get a small kickback and it helps me out. Otherwise, you can support your local independent bookstore. Today, I am wearing a t-shirt from Montana Book Company, which is my favorite independent bookstore. You can also reach out to your library and see if they have copies of this books, these books or will be getting copies of these books because supporting your local library is always a good thing to do. Now, I have a fair amount of books to get through, so let's dive right right in the biggest, perhaps there are a couple of really exciting things in here, but I'd say the most current uh, thing everybody is talking about and loving is James by Percival Everett, which was released earlier in March. And I held off a little bit on getting a copy because I really wanted to get a signed copy. And I knew he was going to be doing an event with Parnassus Bookstore, which is Ann Patchett's, Patchett's bookstore in Tennessee and Ann Patchett will be coming up later. So I knew from her Instagram that he was going to be doing an event. So once he did, I ordered a signed copy and it came, it has this signed with, by Parnassus sticker on it. And honestly, the most exciting thing about this, other than the fact that it is James by Percival Everett and that it is signed, is the bookmark that came with it. It is adorable. So it has these uh, bookshelves on it. I don't know if you can see them all that well. You can sort of see this is the cover of Commonwealth by Ann Patchett. And then there is what is clearly also the Dutch house. But the thing I really love about it is that they have Sparky Van Davender, Ann Patchett's dog, at the bottom. I love that. I think that is so cool. Anyway, this is from Doubleday, and here is the blurb about it. If you, if you don't know what this book is, I don't know where you've been. Maybe you don't pay attention to new releases, but if you pay attention to new releases, odds are you do know. Here is what this is about. It's a brilliant reimagining of the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, both harrowing and ferociously funny, told from the enslaved Jim's point of view. When Jim overhears that he is about to be sold to a man in New Orleans, separated from his wife and daughter forever, he runs away until he can formulate a plan. Meanwhile, Huck has faked his own death to escape his violent father. As all readers of American literature know, thus begins the dangerous journey and transcendent journey by raft down the Mississippi River toward the elusive and unreliable promise of the free states and beyond. Brimming with the electrifying humor and lacerating ob observations that have made Everett a literary icon, this brilliant and tender novel radically illuminates Jim's agency, intelligence, and compassion as never before. James is destined to be a major publishing event and a cornerstone of 21st century American literature. I think if you're taking bets or placing bets about what will win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction next year, this really has to be front and center. Percival Everett has been a finalist before for his book Telephone. The Trees was a shortlisted title for the Booker Prize. Honestly, I thought it was going to be in the Pulitzer conversation much more, and then it wasn't. So I feel like Percival Everett is becoming more and more and more undeniable as a case for uh, the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. And any conversation about next year's Pulitzer Prize has to begin with James by Percival Everett. I just released my predictions for this year. I'll link it down below if you would like to go check that out if you have a spare hour <laughs> or if you just want to jump ahead to the prediction that I made for this year. Now, in all of my book hauls, I like to read a little bit from the opening of the book. So here is the opening of James by Percival Everett. Those little bastards were hiding out there in the tall grass. The moon was not quite full, but bright, and it was behind them, so I could see them as plain as day, though it was deep night. Lightning bugs flashed against the black canvas. I waited at Miss Watson's kitchen door, rocked a loose step board with my foot, knew she was going to tell me to fix it tomorrow. I was waiting there to, for her to give me a pan of cornbread that she had made with my Sadie's recipe. Waiting is a big part of a slave's life, waiting and waiting to wait some more. Waiting for demands, waiting for food, waiting for the ends of days, waiting for the just and deserved Christian reward at the end of it all. 
that is the beginning of James by Percival Everett. That's actually a really good opening to that book. Here's another one that I am really, really, really excited about. It is Fire Exit by Morgan Talty. This is one of the books that is not actually released yet. I believe it comes out June 4th. So if you go to the affiliate link down below, it will be a pre-order link. But here's a PSA. Pre-ordering is a good thing to do because it lets the publisher know how many books they should print. And this close to the publication date, it might get them starting to think about a uh, new printing of the book. It also tells bookstores how many copies of the book they should get. It's just a good thing to do. So this is kind of a gimme for me. I am a huge fan of Night of the Living Res, which was Morgan Talty's debut. It is a collection of linked stories. It is absolutely gorgeous, I would say. So if you have not read Night of the Living Res, let this be my opportunity to encourage you once again to read Night of the Living Res. It's such a good book. So obviously I was really excited for Fire Exit as soon as it was announced. This, as I said, comes out June 4th and Tin House was nice enough to send me an ARC and I cannot wait to read this book. I have very high expectations. That can sometimes be dangerous, but I'm really looking forward to this book a great deal. Here is what it is about. From the porch of his home, Charles Lamisway has watched the life he might have had unfold across the river on Maine's Penobscot Reservation. On the far bank, he caught brief moments of his neighbor Elizabeth's life, from the day she came home from the hospital to her early twenties. But there's always been something deeper and more dangerous than the river that divides him from her and the rest of the tribal community. It's the secret that Elizabeth is his daughter, a secret Charles is no longer willing to keep. Now, it's been weeks since he's seen Elizabeth, and Charles is worried. As he attempts to hold on to and care for what he can, his home and property, his alcoholic, quick-tempered, and big-hearted friend Bobby, and his mother Louise, who is slipping ever deeper into dementia. He becomes increasingly haunted by his past. Forced to confront a lost childhood on the reservation, a love affair cut short, and the death of his beloved stepfather Frederick in a hunting accident, a death he and Louise are at odds over as to where to lay blame, Charles contends with questions he's long been afraid to ask. Is his secret about Elizabeth his to share? And would his daughter want to know the truth, even if it could cost her everything she's ever known? And I'm so excited that Morgan Salty is returning to this Penobscot reservation in Maine. That is the location of Ned of the Living Res, and he knows it well. So, here is the opening of Fire Exit by Morgan Talty. Chapter 1. I wanted the girl to know the truth. I wanted her to know who I was, who I really was, instead of a white man who had lived across from her all her life and watched her grow up from this side of the river. It was late spring. I sat outside drinking coffee and not smoking because my lighter had run out of gas. Fog rolled off the water that divided the Penobscot Reservation from the rest of the state of Maine. I was waiting, as I usually did. Soon, across the river and on the reservation, my girl, a woman by that point, came out of the house and got in her car to go to work. I didn't know how many times I'd been through this same routine, but that morning, something took hold of me. Something was different this time. That is the opening of Fire Exit by Morgan Salty. I cannot wait to read that. Now, if you know me, you know I am a big fan of Keith Haring. So Charlie and Chelsea from Montana Book Company told me last year that this book was coming, and I pre-ordered it immediately on the spot and have just been waiting for it ever since. It is a big kind of brick of a book, but I am really looking forward to reading this at some point. It is Radiant, The Life and Line of Keith Haring by Brad Gooch. There is a bit of a description on the inside of the book. In the 1980s, the subways of New York City were covered with art. In the stations, black matte sheets were pasted over outdated ads, and unsigned chalk drawings often popped up on these blank spaces. These temporary chalk drawings numbered in the thousands and became synonymous with a city as diverse as it was at war with itself, beset with poverty and crime, but alive with art and creative energy. And every single one of those drawings was done by Keith Haring. Herring was one of the most emblematic artists of the 1980s, a figure described by his contemporaries as a prophet in his life, his person, and his work. 
part of an iconic cultural crowd that included Andy Warhol, Madonna, and Jean-Michel Basquiat, he broke down the barriers between high art and popular culture, creating work that was accessible to all and using it as a means to provoke and inspire radical social change. To this day, his influence on our culture remains incontrovertible, and his glamorous, tragically short life, Herring died of AIDS in 1990 at the age of 31, has a unique aura of mystery and power. Brad Gooch, noted biographer of Flannery O'Connor and Frank O'Hara, was granted access to Herring's extensive archive. He has written a biography that will become the authoritative work of, on the artist. Based on interviews with those who knew Herring best and drawing from rich archival history, Radiant sets out to capture the magic of this visionary and timeless icon. By the way, beautiful end papers. If you're going to write a book about Keith Herring, it needs to look attractive. It just needs to, because you need to live up to what Keith Herring did. And this is doing it. This is doing it. And if you're unfamiliar with Keith Herring's art, there are some photographs of his art inside the book. There are really great photos in here. I am going to find one of the more iconic examples. So it looks like this. That's the general look of it. You've probably seen it, and even if you don't necessarily know Keith Haring's name, Joel used to have an iPhone case with this exact design on it. We loved it. But that's the look of Keith Haring's art. I think there's even a photo of the very first piece of Keith Haring's that I knew about, because I grew up on Long Island. We drove into the city all the time, and I saw this mural on a handball court that says, Crack is Whack so many times and it was only as a teenager that I learned that it was a work of art by Keith Haring and there it is so here's a bit from the beginning of this book chapter one cuts town Keith Allen Herring could finally hold a pencil well enough to draw pictures. The year was 1962. He was four years old. Helping him along, as always, was his dad, Allen Herring, at 24, one of the youngest fathers in their small neighborhood in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. Let's stop there, but there is a, an adorable photo as well. So really excited to read this as well. I'm excited to read all of these, but, you know, I'm going to keep saying that. Another new book by an author I have uh, enjoyed the previous work of is uh, Godwin by Joseph O'Neill. I have a copy of Netherlands somewhere on my shelf around here, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of the book Netherland. Netherland is a book that is uh, compared to The Great Gatsby, and it definitely takes inspiration from The Great Gatsby, but I think a lot of people pick it up expecting a strict retelling of The Great Gatsby, and that's not what that book is. It also deals with cricket a lot. The uh, protagonist is someone who has immigrated to the United States, and he gets involved in a sort of underground cricket league that is uh, operated and uh, as all of the players are immigrants to the United States. And I actually wrote a paper about Netherland when I was in college because I think the way it uses cricket as a prism to look at immigration is fascinating. And if you haven't read Netherland, check it out. Great book. So when I heard that Godwin was coming out, I got in interested because I haven't read anything else of Joseph O'Neill's, and he has released books in the meantime between Netherland and this. But this goes back to the world of sport. And if anyone can make me interested in a book about sports... It's Joseph O'Neill. So this is from Pantheon, and it will also be released in June of 2024. So get those pre-orders ready. If you want to start with Netherland, start there. But, you know, think about this one as well. Here is the description of this. Mark Wolf, a brilliant if self-thwarting technical writer, lives in Pittsburgh with his wife, Sushila, and their toddler daughter. His half-brother, Jeff, born and raised in the United Kingdom, is a desperate young soccer agent. He pulls Mark across the ocean into a scheme to track down an elusive prospect known only as Godwin, an African teenager Jeff believes could be the next Lionel Messi. Narrated in turn by Mark and his work colleague Lakeisha Williams, Godwin is a tale of family and migration as well as an international adventure story that implicates the brothers in the beauty and ugliness of soccer, the perils and promises of international business, and the dark history of transatlantic money-making. And I think you see right there... What really appealed to me about this one and made me immediately want to run back to a Joseph O'Neill book is the way it's using sport to explore larger issues about society and culture and the world. And I am so on board <laughs> with all of that. So here is the opening of Godwin by Joseph O'Neill. Wolf was behaving strangely with clients and coworkers. Annie, my co-lead, thought we should give him a written warning in accordance with our guidelines. In her opinion, a recent incident crossed a line. 
I was more cautious. A written warning was a big step. I felt it would be more constructive and less destabilizing to our community to offer Wolf a measure of support. He was a long-standing member of the group. This was the first time that he'd had any real issues with his workplace deportment. I suspected he was having the kind of difficulties that all of us face at one time or another. I told Annie I'd meet him for a coffee and try to find out what was going on. And you can see it even seems to be getting into a bit about work culture and especially the current, uh, there's so much that's fascinating about work culture and how it makes demands of you and how bureaucratic it is. And it seems to be getting into that as well. I am really interested in that book in case you can't tell. Now, if you follow along, you know I am a big fan of Simon Montgomery. Huge, huge, huge. And I really loved Simon Montgomery's book, The Soul of an Octopus. So when Montana Book Company, again, of the t-shirt that I'm wearing, posted that she had a new book called Secrets of the Octopus, we were actually planning to be in Montana Book Company about a week after this came out. So I knew I wanted to look at it and would probably end up purchasing it. And that is exactly what ended up happening. It's a Gorgeous. I mean, stunningly beautiful book. I mean, look at this cover. So this is done in partnership with National Geographic. And I believe it is going to be a companion for a series that Simon Montgomery is collaborating with National Geographic on. And it has the benefit of National Geographic photographs that are absolutely stunning. I mean, when we brought this book home, I immediately just flipped through and was in awe of all of the photographs in this book. Like I, I might actually want to keep this on the coffee table <laughs> because it is that stunning. So here's what it says. From beloved author and octopus lover, Simon Montgomery comes a new look at this fascinating creature and the growing body of knowledge about its intelligence and capabilities. This remarkable book brought to life by brilliant color photographs as only National Geographic can provide reveals an astonishing array of curious behaviors unique to these extraordinary animals. We encounter coconut octopuses carrying shells across the ocean floor, algae octopuses disguising themselves as fuzzy seaweed, and common Sydney octopuses inhabiting Octopolis, a region off eastern Australia where a species long considered solitary congregates en masse. Included with these revelations are 16 illustrated octo profiles about key species written by Warren K. Carlyle IV, founder of Octonation, an online octopus fan club numbering one million strong. I just think everything Simon Montgomery does has a really deep humanity and it, it is very informative. So I'm really excited about this. I haven't actually looked to see what the opening of the book is, but it begins introduction from monster to superhero. Let's just stick with that. I'd never met anyone like Athena before. Although she was an adult, she was only about four feet tall. She measured a mere 40 pounds, and she was unusual in several other respects. She could change color and shape, taste with her skin, drool venom, spit ink, and jet about by squirting water through a siphon on the side of her head. Not to mention pour her baggy, boneless body through an opening the size of an orange. That's the opening of Secrets of the Octopus. If you are unfamiliar, Athena is one of the octopuses that Simon Montgomery meets and interacts with and writes about in The Soul of an Octopus, which is, again, is a fantastic book. I usually love the audiobooks of Simon Montgomery's books because she reads them and she is fantastic. Now, another advanced reader's edition of a book. This is The Other Olympians, Fascism, Queerness, and the Making of Modern Sports by Michael Waters. I mean... Why do you think I was interested in this? That, 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 is, that, that sounds so me. So this is from FSG, and it will be published on June 4th, 2024. It is the story of the early trans athletes and the Olympic bureaucrats who lit the flame for today's culture wars. I'm fascinated by this. I, I am really excited to read it. I, I know I've been saying that about a lot of these. I do tend to read nonfiction books on audio. So there is definitely a chance that I might seek out an audio of The Secrets of the Octopus and The Other Olympians when it is released, but I am very happy to have a copy of this in my house because it just sounds really interesting. And I'm I'm willing to bet if you know me, you know why. But uh, a little more specifically, in December 1935, Zdenek Kubek, one of the most famous sprinters in European women's sports, declared he was now living as a man. Around the same time, the celebrated British field athlete Mark Weston, also assigned female at birth, announced that he, too, was a man. Periodicals and radio programs across the world carried the news. Both became global celebrities. A few decades later, they were all but forgotten. 
and in the wake of their transitions, what could have been a push toward equality became instead, through a confluence of bureaucracy, war, and sheer happenstance, the exact opposite. The now all too familiar panic around trans, intersex, and gender nonconforming athletes. I am really looking forward to reading this book. Here is the opening. Part one is called Triumph. The day before the world changed, Carl Diem walked into Berlin's new sports stadium in high spirits. It was the morning of June 27, 1914, and Diem, a gangly 32-year-old, was there to visit Germany's pre-Olympic Games, a dress rehearsal for the forthcoming event. In two short years, athletes from across the United States and Europe would convene at the very same stadium for the real Olympic Games. Diem needed to make sure it was perfect. That is the beginning of The Other Olympians, Fascism, Queerness, and the Making of Modern Sports by Michael Waters, again coming out in June of this year. So I have a friend who works at Knopf, and they are actually the people who uh, sent me Godwin by Joseph O'Neill. They also sent me Pretty, a memoir by K.B. Brookins, which I confess is a book that I had not heard of. And when I opened the envelope and this was in it, it immediately went on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. Yes, I am already working on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. Let me read you the description of this book and you will see why. Even as it shines a light on the beauty and toxicity of black masculinity from a transgender perspective, the tropes, the presumptions, pretty is as much a powerful and tender love letter as it is a call for change. I should be able to define myself, but I am not, not by any governmental or cultural body, Brookins writes. Every day I negotiate the space between who I am, how I'm perceived, and what I need to unlearn. People have assumed things about me, and I can't change that. Every day I am assumed to be a black American man, though my ID says female, and my heart says neither of the sort. What does it mean to be a girl-turned-man when you're something else entirely? Informed by their personal experiences growing up in Texas, those of other transgender masculine people, black queer studies, and cultural criticism, Brookins writes about the marginalization suffered by a unique American constituency, whose condition is a world apart from that of cisgender, non-black, and non-masculine people. Here is a memoir, a building's Roman of sorts, about coming to terms with instantly and always being perceived as other sounds fascinating right so this is going to be on sale may 28th 2024 according to this uh release dates that haven't come yet are subject to change so you know don't get mad at me if it's not <laughs> what's on the book but that is what's on the book so hopefully it will stay the same here's the opening of pretty a memoir until i wasn't before the texas heat could cut through bodies like glass there was a nighttime breeze my mother felt a rumble in her belly that sent her hurling over a toilet seat, gunks of upchucks getting stuck in her hair. Sure, she'd gotten food poisoning or a bug that upset her stomach before, but this rumble was different. It stayed often. It felt unprecedented for her still-growing 17-year-old body, so she hurried to get a pregnancy box from the pharmacy that is now an apartment complex. That's the opening of Pretty, a memoir by K.B. Brookins. And that takes us to 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem by Nam Le, which was also in that same envelope with Godwin and Pretty, a memoir. And I have heard of Nam Le because he wrote a book, and I am completely blanking on what that book was called. Bear with me a moment while I look. The book is called The Boat, and it got a lot of attention when it was published, and I hadn't ever seen anything else by Nam Le. And now here is this I do try to read more poetry every year, it feels like. It's something that I struggle with. So I'm looking forward to this. And I have wanted to read something by Namle because I heard so many good things about the boat. And then it just completely fell off my radar in the in, in between years. So I'm looking forward to this. And I'm glad that it was sent to me. Uh, again, this is from Knopf, in case you couldn't tell, because it came in the same envelope as Pretty and Godwin. In his first international release since the award-winning best-selling The Boat, Nam Le delivers a shot across the bow with a book-length poem that honors every convention of diasporic literature in a virtuosic array of forms and registers before shattering the form itself. This book is an urgent, unsettling reckoning with identity and the violence of identity. For Le, a Vietnamese refugee in the West, this means the assumed violence of racism, oppression, and historical trauma. But it also means the violence of that assumption, of being always assumed to be outside one's home country, culture, or language, and the complex violence for the diasporic writer who wants to address any of this of language itself. And I've never 
had a poetry book to read from the opening of, and I did look at the first poem, and it has it seems to have a little bit of dialect, and I am not going to attempt that. So I'm just going to say I'm happy to have this book, and maybe I'll read it in April, because I believe April is National Poetry Month. So stay tuned for that. Now we have Mean Spirit by Linda Hogan. I had been interested in reading this because when it was initially recommended to me, somebody said that it is essentially the story of Killers of the Flower Moon, but written as a novel and by an indigenous person, which is really compelling. So I would like to read it. Here is what it says. Early in this century, rivers of oil were found beneath Oklahoma land belonging to Indian people, and beautiful Grace Blanket became the richest person in the territory, but she was murdered by the greed of white men and the Grey Cloud family, who cared for her daughter, began dying mysteriously too. Letters begging for help sent to Washington, D.C. went unanswered until at last a Native American government official, Stace Redhawk, traveled west to investigate. What he found has been documented by history, rampant fraud, intimidation and murder but he also found something truly extraordinary his deepest self and abiding love for his people and their brave past it sounds like killers of the flower moon right <laughs> this was also a pulitzer prize finalist so it is adjacent to my pulitzer prize project and i love things that are adjacent to my pulitzer prize project and this will be a very interesting book to read in that context because the book that won that year instead of this is rabbit at rest by john updike and I read the first book in the Rabbit series last year in anticipation of reading John Updike for my project, and I hated it. So this will be really interesting. Here is how it opens. Oklahoma, 1922. That summer, a water diviner named Michael Horse forecast a two-week dry spell. Until then, Horse's predictions were known to be reliable, and since it was a scorching hot summer, a good number of Indians moved their beds outdoors in hopes a chance breeze would pass over and provide relief from the hot nights. They set them up far from the houses that held the sun's heat long after dark. Cots were unfolded in kitchen gardens. White iron beds sat in horse pastures. Four posters rested in cornfields that were lying fallow. That's the beginning of Mean Spirit by Linda Hogan. Now, when we were at Montana Book Company and got Secrets of the Octopus, we also got Heartstopper Volume 5, which was recently released. I've read the other books in the Heartstopper series, so why would I not do this one? <laughs> and we've been watching the TV adaptation, and, you know, I don't even know if there's a plot description anywhere. Okay, here we go. Nick and Charlie are in love. They've finally said those three little words, and Charlie has almost persuaded his mom to let him sleep over at Nick's house. He wants to take their relationship to the next level but can he find the confidence he needs and with nick going off to university next year is everything about to change and i think this is the penultimate heart stopper i think there is going to be one more volume of it so that will be interesting and just like with poetry i don't really know how to read the opening of a graphic novel um yeah it just opens with drum playing so we'll leave it at that and if you are a fan of heartstopper you know exactly why i am interested in reading that now angela's ashes by frank mccourt i've already read this i actually was i think 15 20 maybe 30 percent into the audiobook when i said to myself i really am going to want a copy of this book for my library so i went to my local used bookstore they had this beautiful paperback edition of it and because i've read it i'm going to kind of gloss over this uh and just tell you that this is a devastatingly sad but also incredibly funny memoir by frank mccourt about his childhood growing up impoverished in ireland i will link a video where joel and i both talk about this book down below when we uh, we read it in march so it'll be in our reading wrap up and it is absolutely phenomenal this edition is published by touchstone which is from simon and schuster and here is the opening of the book. My father and mother should have stayed in New York, where they met and married and where I was born. Instead, they returned to Ireland when I was four, my brother Malachi three, the twins Oliver and Eugene barely one, and my sister Margaret dead and gone. It's the opening of Angela's Ashes, a tremendous, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful memoir. Sad and funny and beautiful both. Then we have The Trees by Conrad Richter. So when we were in Helena and at Montana Book Company, we walked down uh, a block away where there is a used bookstore called Aunt Bonnie's. And Conrad Richter won a Pulitzer Prize for the third installment of a trilogy. So it begins with The Trees, and then you have The Fields, and then The Town, which is the book that he won a Pulitzer for. So I would like to read the two books that came before The Town, but it has been very difficult to try to find them. So I was thrilled when I saw this. This is 
a moving story of the beginning of the American trek to the West at the close of the 18th century. So vivid is his description of the land, so real his characters and their problems that one forgets he is painting a picture of an early American epic. That is from the New York Times. This edition is published by Ohio University Press. And here is the opening of the book. Chapter one is called The Vision. They moved along in the bobbling, springy gate of a family that followed the woods as some families follow the sea. In the midday twilight of the forest, the father's shaggy gray figure looked humpbacked, but the hump was a pack. In that pack, under his rifle, were a frow and auger, bar lead and powder, blacksmith's traps, and a bag of Indian meal wrapped up in a pair of yellow yarn blankets. That is The Trees by Conrad Richter a book that is sort of adjacent to my Pulitzer Prize project as well. Then here's where Ann Patchett comes back into things. My library had a copy of State of Wonder for a dollar, and I wasn't going to say no to that. I love Tom Lake. Check out my Pulitzer predictions for this year. If Again, they'll be linked down below uh, to see how much I loved Tom Lake. So State of Wonder is one of the books people frequently point to uh, when I was looking for other books by Ann Patchett to read. It has a very fun cover. Kind of reminds me of Demon Copperhead a little bit. Like you have these little snakes along the border. Just kind of fun. Dr. Marina Singh, a research scientist with a Minnesota-based pharmaceutical company, is sent to Brazil to track down her former mentor, Dr. Anik Swenson, who seems to have all but disappeared in the Amazon while working on what is destined to be an extremely valuable new drug. Nothing about the assignment is easy. Not only does no one know where Dr. Swenson is, but the last person who was sent to find her, Marina's research partner, Anders Ekman, died before he could complete his mission. Plagued by trepidation, Marina embarks on an odyssey into the insect-infested jungle in hopes of finding Dr. Swenson, as well as answers to troubling questions about her friend's death, the state of her company's future, and her own past. Let's leave it at that. There's more in the description, but let's just leave it at that. This is published by Harper, and here is how State of Wonder begins. The news of Anders Ekman's death came by way of Aerogram, a piece of bright blue airmail paper that served as both the stationery and, when folded over and sealed along the edges, the envelope. Who even knew they still made such things? This single sheet had traveled from Brazil to Minnesota to mark the passing of a man, a breath of tissue so insubstantial that only the stamp seemed to anchor it to this world. Mr. Fox had the letter in his hand when he came to the lab to tell Marina the news. When she saw him there at the door, she smiled at him. And in the light of that smile, he faltered. It's the opening of State of Wonder by Ann Patchett. It shows again that she is a beautiful writer, and I'm looking forward to that. Now, going back to the Pulitzer family of authors, my library, uh, not my library, my local used bookstore had a copy of Lost in the City by Edward P. Jones, who won a Pulitzer Prize for the Known World, which is one of my five-star predictions for my Pulitzer Prize project. I've heard, I've heard so many good things about that. And I recently found a copy, or Joel found a copy of all Aunt Hagar's Children, which is a story collection by Edward P. Jones uh, for me as well. So when I get around to the known world, I will probably read at least one of those books as well, just to really get a sense of him as a writer. The nation's capital that serves as the setting for the stories in Edward P. Jones's prize-winning collection, Lost in the City, lies far from the city of historic monuments and national politicians. Jones takes the reader beyond that world into the complicated lives of African-American men, women, and even children such as the girls set to begin elementary school in the first day, who work against the constant threat of loss to maintain a sense of hope. From the girl who raised pigeons to the well-to-do career woman awakened in the night by a phone call that will take her on a journey back to the past, the characters in these stories forge bonds of community as they struggle against the limits of their city to stave off the loss of family, friends, memories, and ultimately themselves. I'm really looking forward to reading Edward P. Jones again because I've heard so many good things. I only just saw this it's signed it is amazing what you can find in your used bookstores i didn't even know that it's addressed to bob best wishes edward p jones how cool <laughs> i had no idea that's fun so the first story in this collection is called The Girl Who Raised Pigeons, and it opens like this. Her father would say years later that she had dreamed that part of it, that she had never gone out through the kitchen window at two or three in the morning to visit the birds. By that time in his life, he would have so many notions about himself set in concrete, and having always believed that he slept lightly, he would not want to think that a girl of nine or ten could walk by him at such an hour in the night without his waking and asking of the dark, who is it? What's the matter? It's the beginning of Lost in the City, a story collection by Edward P. Jones that is signed. And I didn't even know that. I just wanted to have it. That That, that is mind-boggling and really cool. So 
These are the books that I brought into my library in the month of March. I would love to hear if you have thoughts about any of them, recommendations for where I should begin, or recommendations for anything you think I would like based on my interest in all of these books. Let me know about that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.